Yesterday, of course, the commissioner of baseball saying that Pete Rose's ban is being upheld. And Pete's talking about it right now. Let's listen in to Pete out in Las Vegas. We're a hell of a lot worse than the 26 years I spent in the big leagues, as you can imagine. And, um, you know, I put my family through a lot of things over the years, and they stuck behind me. Uh, my fans have stuck behind me, and I appreciate that. Uh, I can't tell you the, the, the ongoing support I get everywhere I go. And, uh, and I think that's partly because of the way I played the game, the way I approach the game, the way I try to sell the game. Uh, to be, to be honest with you, I should actually be the commissioner of baseball. <laughs> the, way, the way I talk about the game of baseball. I mean, and I know Mr. Manfred, the new commissioner, would do a great job. I got a lot of respect for the office of the commissioner. And, you know, I've really had maybe three dads in my life. Uh, one was my dad, and two was Sparky Anderson. And three, believe it or not, uh, was Bart Giamatti. You know, he really uh, helped me when I was a young player, and he became the president of the National League. And I had several meetings with him about what we could do to make the game of, of baseball a, a better game. And as you know, he's the one that uh, suspended me uh, back in 1989. But uh, all the time he did that, he was trying to help me. And it took me some years to understand that, but I finally did understand exactly what he meant when he told me to reconfigure my life. And uh, there was a time in my life when I was out of control, gambling. Um, I guess there's probably a lot of people in this town who could be out of control gambling. Uh, but I worked hard at it. I got it under wraps the last several, several, several years. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm in control of my life right now. And I'm doing well. Uh, I only get to watch baseball, but I get to comment a, about baseball on Fox. I get to come here to my restaurant and talk to people every night or down to Mandalay Bay where I work four hours a day, constantly talking about fans of baseball and constantly trying to make the game a better game, uh, help young players, I mean young players, 12, 13 years old, get off to uh, the right step, get off to the, the right course. You know, there's a course that you got to get on, you got to stick to it. And uh, that's about it. I don't know if I missed anything, Ray. Or, Mark, did I miss anything? Uh, I'm sure they have some questions for you after Mark. Mark's from L.A., by the way, but he was born in Cincinnati, so he's a good guy. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Mark Rosenbaum, M-A-R-K-R-O-S-E-N-B-A-U-M. And I want to start out, Pete, by thanking you. It's been a privilege to be able to represent you. I, uh, I did grow up in Cincinnati. I, I know what you meant to that town. I know what you meant to the families there. I know how you brought generations together. And so I'm very grateful for that. I also want to thank the commissioner and Mr. McHale. They were cordial to us. They uh, were open with us. And they provided Pete with an opportunity to talk about his life and his mistakes and we appreciate those courtesies. I want to just talk about two things this morning very briefly. The first is this. It's undisputed that Pete broke the cardinal rule of baseball. But I want you to know that over the past 26 years that Pete, following the admonition of Commissioner Giamatti, has changed his life. He is a changed man. He is a repentant man. He is a man whose life is under control. I have seen Pete in some of these very difficult circumstances. I've seen him break down when he discussed the impact of his actions on his children. He told a story to Commissioner Manfred about seeing his son in minor league baseball being heckled by fans, the music, the gambler being played, people in the stands waving $10 and $20 bills. And Pete said, in this world we're supposed to make it better for our children, but I made it worse. 
and I know the toll that that's taken on Pete. I've seen Pete break down when he talked about how he felt that he let his father down in committing the sort of acts that he has. And I've watched Pete as he has placed the two things that he puts most important in his life, baseball and his family, first. How do we know that Pete has changed? You've never heard of Pete with respect to any scandal. You've never heard of Pete with respect to any binge, with respect to any legal problems. We're in a city where what happens in Las Vegas does not stay in Las Vegas, but you've never heard of Pete embarrassing himself over these past three decades. He lives an orderly, I would say bore, boring life, <laughs> but a well-disciplined life that is committed to his passions. His focus has been watching baseball, talking baseball, and taking care of his family. I want to say one other thing about the Hall of Fame. When Pete came to Ray and me, and we discussed filing a petition for reinstatement, Pete was very clear that he was not doing that in order to become eligible for the Hall of Fame. In fact, he said, I don't want to do it for that reason. I don't want that part of the petition. I want one thing. I want to be on the same side of baseball. I don't want anyone to think that I am at war with baseball. I don't want to be at odds with baseball. But in my view, Commissioner Manfred got it exactly right when he said at page three of his decision, the considerations that should drive a decision on whether to work in baseball are not the same as those that should drive a decision on Hall of Fame eligibility. I think it makes a difference whether Pete is eligible for the Hall of Fame. I think that is part of his legacy. I think that is part of what history demands. I think that is part of what baseball fans demand. And so I wonder about this. I wonder if it is worth asking this simple question. What does baseball gain by keeping Pete Rose from even being considered for entry for eligibility into the Hall of Fame. The determination as to whether he should be eligible for the Hall of Fame has always been based on achievement on the field. If there is concern about deterrence, what Major League Baseball player would say, I will break a cardinal rule because after 26 years of going through what Pete has gone through, I can then be considered eligible. Pete's accomplishments, such as being the all-time hit leader, warrant his inclusion at minimum for consideration in the Hall of Fame. Pete played the game exactly as it was intended to be played. No one contends that his accomplishments or his play were ever tainted or ever compromised in any way. He has been punished, and he has been punished severely by being banished from the game he loves, denied now for over a quarter of a century, and forever from ever being considered to be a manager or a coach or an advisor or a scout. The Hall of Fame by design reflects achievements on the field, not character or behavior off the field. Indeed, players and others who did terrible harm to the game, as for example by defending and maintaining the color line or by engaging in racial harassment have been considered eligible for the Hall of Fame 
and some are, in fact, in the Hall of Fame. It is, after all, the Hall of Fame, not the Hall of Saints. We are a nation of second chances. Grace and forgiveness are among our nation's greatest virtues. But when it comes to the Hall of Fame, I implore the committee not to give Pete a second chance, but to give him a first chance. A chance to be evaluated on who he was as a player and what he gave to the game on the field. And finally, I implore the committee to do this during Pete's lifetime. Again, I want to thank you, Pete, for the opportunity to be part of your team and to the commissioner for listening to our petition. We can take a few questions now. Pete, I asked you, you said some very high things about the commissioner, and it shows you have a great deal of respect for him. I want to know just your overall reaction. What's going through your heart and mind? I mean, obviously, the decision did not come out the way you wanted it to. What's your reaction to the overall decision? Well, obviously, a disappointment, no question about that. But um, I've been saying this for many, many years now that I'm not going to sit here on Las Vegas Boulevard and complain about something because I'm the one that screwed up. I'm the one that made the mistake. I can only hope that I can prevent other people from making the kind of mistakes that I made in the game of baseball, especially young people. Uh, that, that, that's the way it is. And uh, uh, you win some, you lose some. And you get rained out unless you're in the dome. So uh, it's just, it's just uh, part of life. Uh, if I could change the way my life was lived, obviously I would change. But uh, you can't rewrite something that's already happened. You have to live with it. But you have to try to become a better person because of it. And try to make the people around you better people. And that's, that's what I do on a consistent basis. I'm a good guy, to be honest with you. Could you clarify one thing? I see, maybe if I write it correctly, tell me, in the commissioner's statement, he seemed to suggest, or maybe he said, Cloud, that you told him you are still gambling on baseball. I, I don't know if I got that right or wrong. Or the gambling and including baseball. Yes, well, unlike, unlike 30 years ago when I was out of control as a gambler, uh, I look at myself today, um, I don't live in Las Vegas because I gamble. I live in Las Vegas because that's where my job is, and that's, this is the only town where my job works, is Las Vegas. Uh, you're probably the same as me. I'm a recreational gambler now. You know, if I want to go home and watch something on TV and make a small bet on it, I don't bet every day. I don't, uh, uh, I don't, I'm not a casino guy. You know, I don't play blackjack. I don't do the roulette, I don't do dice, I don't do all that kind of stuff. Uh, I occasionally like to go bet on horses because I used to be a horse owner and I got a lot of respect for a lot of in influential people in that industry. And uh, But everything I do is legal. You know, no more no more uh, behind the scenes stuff that, that got me in trouble. And, and I'm very selective of people I associate myself with which was another reason I got in trouble back in the in the, in the 70s or the 80s, I should say. But uh, that, that's that's the way. But I I tried to be as as honest as I could with the commissioner, and I think he respected that. And I made a couple mistakes during the meeting, but by the time we left the meeting, I clarified the, the mistakes that I meant that I said, because uh, some of his questions I kind of panicked. If you, you, I hope you never in that situation, but. You have? I don't, I don't know if we've all been there. <laughs> How do you feel about people, ball players, that have attained with a steroid scandal while they were playing baseball, uh, allegedly had to actually cheer while they were playing, being eligible for the Hall of Fame? Well, well, first of all, um, I can honestly say that no one on my team or none of the players I played against took steroids, in my knowledge. Uh, and I'm not going to sit here and, and, and badmouth guys who are linked to steroids uh, because they're friends of mine. You know, Barry Bonds is a friend of mine. 
A-Rod's a friend of mine. Clemens is a friend of mine. Uh, I don't know Sosa, but uh, he was a great player. I don't know Palmero, but uh, they'll be judged by somebody. And I'm not going to compare the two. It's, it's, it's very similar. Don't compare my case to Joe Jackson. You know, there, there are different cases in different periods of time in our country. So uh, I just I just hope those guys understand the mistakes they made and they can try to help people or prevent people from making the same mistakes that they made. You know, all you can do uh, if you make mistakes is, is try to learn from your mistakes and try to try to be a better, better person for it. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's not rocket science, but uh, um, I can honestly say no one on no one on my team or no one I ever played with. Uh, boy, if the big red machine would have took steroids, we might have never lost a game. Why did you continue the gamble? Did you not think it would affect your case for Well, you have to understand, and a lot of people don't understand this, but. Uh, why did you continue the gamble? Well, I didn't continue the gamble like I used to. And uh, I worked hard my whole life. And I'm 74 years old, and that's the way I get my enjoyment. I'm not a stock market guy. You know, I'm, I'm not uh, with DraftKings and all that stuff online. I do none of that stuff. You know, but uh, uh, if I want to bet on a football game, go home and watch it, that's, a, that's, my, that's my night of enjoyment. So, and you're, you're, you're partly right. I, sh I shouldn't have did that, but I got to live my life. You're only here once. If you live right, once is enough. So, you know, uh, but like I said, everything I, do to, everything I do today is legal. You know, I... I and in control. And I'm in control of myself. I'm in control of what I'm doing. Good question, though. Do you feel... Feel like this is it? This is your last shot at getting reinstated, and then we're no, not really, because uh, I'll continue. I'll continue the path of reconfiguring my life. Tomorrow, yesterday, next week, next year, next month, uh, and all I can do is is uh, try to be a better person every day. Where eventually they they'll want me in. They want me to be back, but I, I just have to keep this thing going here. You know, keep this thing going for how, how many more years? I, you know, my son's there. If I if I if I kick the bucket, I mean, he can make a speech in Cooperstown. He's an educated kid. So. Oh, I love Cincinnati. You know, I love the fans. A lot of people there say sometimes you've been your own worst enemy. I have been, no question about it. No, but I've learned from my experiences. Uh, but also a lot of people clap when I go to the ballpark too but I would I love the fans of the Queen City I mean that's the baseball capital of the world as far as I'm concerned and I, I've been I've been treated uh, like a king in Cincinnati and uh, and I think everybody in Cincinnati if I'm not mistaken kind of understands that I understand that I messed up. See what just started? Let him finish. Let him finish. Hey, there are millions of fans. In regards to that topic of the door still being open, millions of fans who want to know what they can do next. They support you in Cincinnati and globally. What can they do over the next couple of years if the door is still open for reinstatement and the Hall of Fame? Well, uh, just continue to be positive, uh, support my foundation, Hustle for Heroes. You know, I know a lot of people don't know that here today, but you know, every day of this, in this, in this country, JT, 22 veterans commit suicide. And when I found out that last year sometime, we started this foundation just trying to help people. That's, that's all I try to do is help people, whether it's veterans or whether it's young players or whether it's veteran players or whether it's just uh, uh, Little League players. You know, you always got to try to help somebody because I've been through everything in my life. I've been through so many experiences, good, bad, and indifferent. And I think, I th I think based on what, what I've done in the past, people can learn a lot and maybe they won't make the mistakes that I made.
You know, if I can add to that, and this goes to the question the young woman asked before, I'm a civil rights lawyer by trade, and I represent homeless veterans. And when Pete found out about that, Pete said, what can I do to help out? And Pete has communicated with many of the homeless veterans whom I represent, veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan, one in particular who was in the first, <coughs> excuse me, the first group that went to the Tora Bora Mountains to, lock, to look for Osama bin Laden, and who now lives on the streets. And Pete went to him and assisted him. And I suppose if Pete's life were oriented about getting back into baseball, you would have heard a lot of publicity about that. But Pete made it clear to me that he wanted to do it, but he didn't want to have a press conference about it, and he didn't want to publicize it. He just wanted to be there. You hear a lot about ball players going to hospitals and talking to young and older people who are in very bad shape. And I know this, and Ray knows this. We've seen Pete do that. We've seen Pete talk to families, find out that a loved one is in a hospital, and go visit them. And you haven't heard about that either. And if Pete's life were oriented about getting back into baseball, that would have been the first brochure that we would have given the commissioner. But Pete always insisted that he wanted to do it for the act itself. And I think that's part of reconfiguring. I think that's part of what Commissioner Giamatti meant. That Pete would take responsibility for his actions and that would his actions would be from what came from within, not how others would relate to them one way or the other. And Pete has done that time and time again with vets and time and time again with young kids and time and time again with people who could use a pat on the back from the greatest hitter in the history of baseball. You know, one of my dads I mentioned, Sparky Anderson, uh, what, what Marky's talking about, uh, back in the 70s. Every off day we had, Sparky uh, would go to the hospital and visit kids. But he would never go if there was a TV camera. He did it for the kids. He didn't do it for himself. And I guess uh, that's where I learned that. Uh, from Sparky Anderson, you know, that uh, you can make a difference. You can help people just by being you. And just by being me, I can help people, whether they're 90 or whether they're four. I, mean, I did a thing over in uh, Lancaster uh, for handicapped people the other day at a school, and there was a person there four years old, and there was there one there 92. And they don't live there, they come there every day. And they just, it was unbelievable to see the director of the school, how, how uh, he, he knew everybody's name and he put a smile on everybody's face every time he talked to them. It was just, uh, it, was, it was heartwarming, it really was. And uh, that's the same thing that happens to me when I visit these vets. You know, they're the reason we're able to sit out here on Las Vegas Boulevard and give us with each other and have fun and, and uh, you know, live our lives like we do. You know, it's Never, not this. It's can't not, forget those people. It's not the same thing. But um, my son was at the University of Michigan, and he was working on a paper. And he asked me, "Could I call Pete and interview him for the paper?" I said, "Well, sure, you can try." So he calls Pete, and he's talking to Pete, and I get a text from him. He won't shut up. I'll, <laughs> I'll never get off the phone. And that was unusual because I'm an Ohio State fan, okay? And he's in Michigan. <laughs> Let me ask you, your family knows what you've done, your fans know what you've done, those who maybe aren't your fans know what you've done. Um, why is it so important to have that plaque in the, uh, the Hall of Fame? Well, I don't think anybody, uh, I don't think anybody up here uh, uh, was saying how important it is uh, to have the plaque in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I think what we're saying is... Uh, based on how I approach the game and the records that I do have, it would be nice to have the opportunity to go to the Hall of Fame. I don't think any player, well I know, no player ever starts off thinking he's going to the Hall of Fame. When you start off in baseball, all you're hoping for is you can come back the next year, then the next year, then the next year, then the first thing you know is 15 years, then the next thing you know is 20 years. Then you start uh, getting introduced to Johnny Bench, Joe Morgan, and Tony Perez, and Sparky Anderson. 
and Mike Schmidt, great players, Steve Carlton, Tom Seaver, Frank Robinson, Barry Larkin, uh, Gary Carter, Andre Dawson. Those are all the, all the great players that I played with, all Hall of Famers. So my whole life has been a Hall of Fame life just by the association with the teammates I had. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Hell, I got all for the big red machine. The next three guys up got statues at the ballpark. How many players can be in that position? No wonder I scored all those runs. If they were to put a plaque in there but no ceremony, would that be satisfying to you? Or, I mean, here's the plaque, you walk by, you know. I, mean, I don't want to cut you off, but he said clearly, and I think maybe as a fan and as a draft, the uh, Hall of Fame is important kind of to us, but he said clearly that he's part of the game helping the folks. In the Listen, here, here, here's the thing in a nutshell, okay? And, and I told Mr. Manfred this, okay? All I want to be, all I, all I, all I, all I look forward to being someday is friends of baseball. I want baseball and Pete Rose to be friends. That's all I want for it. So I can say uh, I'm not an outsider looking in. I got grandkids. They want, they want their grandpa to be associated with baseball. That's all. You said that, you know, the attitude for a long time, the attitude about gambling. I, you know, there's no way to talk about what's going to happen for 10 years. It's David, I hope I'm around here 10 years from now. Okay, I will talk. We'll still be turning hamburgers. <laughs> Last question. You think it's a little uh, hypocritical of uh, Major League Baseball to have a business relationship? Well, you know, yet, like I said, I don't. You out of the game because you go over the sports you, books and bet on. You can make that evaluation. I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm not a DraftKings guy. I'm not a. Uh, online guy I, I don't have a uh, an account in offshore uh, I don't have a, uh, a credit line at any casino in this town I'm, I'm not that ty I'm not that type of guy I just I just try to have fun and live my life and and, and, and try to have some enjoyable moments and uh, I don't know what baseball is doing I know mr. Manfred knows what the hell he's doing he's going to be a great commissioner and uh, there's a reason why they do what they do, and I'm not here to second guess what they do. Uh, but that don't mean I still can't be disappointed. I wasn't given a, a reinstatement, but I'm not going to get mad at anybody. I'm, I'm the one that, that caused this situation. If I hadn't started being out of control back in the in the, in the, the late '80s, we wouldn't be standing here today. You'd be out Christmas shopping for your wife. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Happy holidays to you.